up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. What counts in life is not the mere fact that we have lived. It is what difference we have made to the lives of others that will determine the significance of the life we lead. Is a quote from Nelson Mandela, anti-apartheid activist, revolutionary, political leader, and Nobel Peace Prize laureate, the first president of the Republic of South Africa. I thought this was an appropriate quote for our discussion today, as Nelson Mandela embodied the core values of equality, compassion, and human dignity, all resonating strongly with our guest today. Our guest is social entrepreneur Ronnie Khan Ao, founder and chief executive officer of Oz Harvest. Founded in 2004, Oz Harvest has gone on to become a leading food rescue organization on a quest to nourish our country by stopping good food from going to waste and delivering it to charities that help feed people in need. In her mission, Ronnie also serves in an advisory capacity to government. She was the subject of an eye-opening film, Food Fighter, and was recognized as Australian Local Hero of the Year in 2010. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Limitations, a show where we speak to elite world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies and that you could apply to your own life. I am your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner of Blenheim Partners, the number one research-led executive search and board advisory firm. In a riveting discussion, Ronnie talks about her journey to self-discovery the experiences that led her to uncovering her life's purpose. And through intrepid entrepreneurship with social impact, the founding of Oz Harvest. With a mission to halve food wastage in Australia by 2030, which is no small feat, especially during a time where food security and availability are continuously being tested, Ronnie challenges us to shift our thinking and encourages us to take on a greater role in making a difference. So sit back and enjoy Leading from the heart. Ronnie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for this awesome opportunity. Well, the first thing, which is obvious to say, congratulations on a great book. Thank you. It was a, a wonderful challenge, but an exciting finish. Is it all in there, Ronnie? Oh, don't be crazy. I mean, there's a lot, and I'm sure people would be very surprised that there's more, but of course, you have to choose what you put in. From what I've heard, you've been um, very honest and very open. And the feedback's been from outstanding, has it not? You know, I was thinking about that today. I've only heard from people who love the books. I figured that those who don't haven't told me, but it seems to have resonated and really connected with just the most extraordinary variety of people. Why did you put pen to paper? You know, 17 years ago when I started Oz Harvest, about a year in, somebody said to me, you should write a book. Now, if only I would thought about keeping a journal, that would have made my life much easier. But two years ago when I started writing, because it took about two years to write, I just reached a point that I thought I mentor people, I reach people, I talk to people, but there's so many more. Perhaps it would be valuable to put down some thoughts. And it's not the book that I intended to write. I intended to write a book that was very much about lessons learned, you know, very simple, like 10 lessons or whatever. Anyway, once I started, I, I'm always very much about honesty and authenticity. And suddenly I was also working and writing with my daughter-in-law, which as you can appreciate is an interesting challenge. You know, I still wanted to keep my son and my daughter-in-law, but they kind of figured that they knew me best and she knew me best. And she said, how could somebody else write your book? 
And in fact, she was right. But she definitely steered me and and brought out stuff that I had no intention of bringing to life. But it seems the juicy bits are what most people like. <laughs> Still talking to her? <laughs> most definitely. Now, that's an interesting accent. Where are you from, Ronnie? So it's a good question. I once asked a taxi driver in New York. I said to him when he got me in the taxi, I said, where are you from? He said, the airport. <laughs> I said, okay, where were you born? What is your accent? Like you didn't, I didn't, I like you didn't ask him where he's going to. <laughs> exactly. So I was born in South Africa, but I spent many years living in Israel and then many years living in Australia. So when I go back to South Africa, people think I'm an Australian. Here, people pick up that there's an accent and that I was probably born somewhere else. So you grew up at a time during pretty tough times, weren't there, where the racial divide was at its highest, I guess? Absolutely. I was born during the apartheid era, and I have to say one of the darkest periods, certainly in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And a very, very challenging and difficult time. But you're from a, fair to say, privileged background, I guess, in that standards? I was privileged because I was born white in a country where you discriminated against people who were black. I was privileged because absolutely we were middle class. Compared to some of my peers and friends, we were like poorer, um, but we were absolutely privileged and grew up with the same luxuries and um, I'm trying to think of a good word to describe the privileges of being white in South Africa at that time. It meant that you had staff who worked for you yeah. in your homes. So we had nannies and that was because my parents wanted to employ people. Yeah. So it always oh, sounds okay, like right. a justification. Yeah, and was it, you think or not? Um, look, it was what everybody did. And it certainly, hopefully, you know, my parents treated our staff well, but quite honestly, they were staff. What does it teach you about, you know, you've seen it from you know, some of the, the cruelest and harshest angles. What does it teach you about social pressures? You know, it's just extraordinary to think that a whole society could choose to discriminate against people because of the color of their skin. And I was privileged in another way that I didn't mention. My parents' values were very strong. Yeah, right. And so at home, they told us that this wasn't acceptable. But when it's law, it's very, you have to be very brave and courageous to fight that. They put me in a school that was quite liberal and liberal in South Africa at that time meant you were very left-leaning. Okay. And so that was a way for them to educate us. But quite honestly, it's a little bit like when you think of Germany during the 30s. Mm. How did a cultured, exquisite, extraordinary culture become the culture that it became under one mad human being? Yep. And in a way, that was the kind of culture I lived in. And ultimately, like the likes of Hitler, quite often it's the intelligent people who follow. Absolutely. And much like in South Africa. You make mention in your book about Flory. Yeah. Oh, I'm not sure about Flory. Can you maybe share something about Flory? Sure. You know, you mention her name and it's like a little lump goes into my throat. So Flory was my nanny, okay. my second mother in a way. And this is part of the tragedy of South Africa in a way, because our maids looked after us, loved us, cooked for us, um, really brought us up. Not that my mother wasn't there, but Flory was absolutely a constant until one day she wasn't. And the tragedy around that is, you know, obviously in normal life, people pass, people move, people, there's preparation. In South Africa, when our maids came and went, nobody spoke about it. Nobody shared with me that actually Flory might have had to go away. I still don't know the reason that one day she disappeared. And it was just an acceptable thing. And I think that actually many white South Africans might have separation trauma because at some point, someone very, very close to them disappeared, moved on for whatever reason. So Flory was my beloved, I guess, second mother. 
mm-hmm. who I lost. Have you been back to South Africa? I've been back many times because, well, many times in the last few years. It took a long time. Yep. I didn't go back until after Mandela had been released, which was extraordinary to see the difference. But in the last couple of years, South Africa Harvest has opened, and and that for me was so meaningful. It's what I pushed for Mm -hmm. because I left South Africa, although I was educated there, and never went back to live there. And opening South Africa Harvest for me was, in a way, my way of giving back and sharing and giving something significant to a country that, although I don't call my own, was certainly the place that I was brought up. How do you see it now? Look, I'm just very excited that, as I say, South Africa Harvest is there. I love to visit the sounds, the smells, the fragrances, the voices absolutely resonate with me. It's my childhood, but Australia is my home. You packed your bags, you left South Africa, and you go to Israel. Yep. How old were you? I had just turned 17. I'd never been on an aeroplane. I had never left home. I used to go to summer holiday camps and cry all holiday camps because I missed my parents so much. And next thing I'm on a plane to another country where in those days, I spoke to my parents once in the first year because who could call? We and didn't it, have a telephone call cost a fortune. That's right, yeah. And you had three minutes and you'd say, hello, how are you? Hello, how are you? No, how are you? Are you doing okay? And then three minutes was up. So it was an extraordinary experience, but amazing. (laughs) You didn't go for a normal life, but did you? You went to a kibbutz, did you not? I did. Well, I went ostensibly to study at university, and I thought I'd probably go for a year. I certainly didn't pack to leave my mother country. Okay. I left thinking I'd go to university, although I had a sister who'd already gone there and another sister that was going there. Um, and I had a boyfriend at the time who was joining me a year later and he had decided to go to kibbutz and because we were together, I landed up living on kibbutz, which was a fascinating social exercise and a fascinating and wonderful experience, but challenging. Is it really good? Well, as a volunteer, it's amazing. It's It's pretty tough, isn't it? You know... It's not tough. It's an extraordinary lifestyle. And the tough part is you work physically hard or you there's a huge expectation that you work according to your ability. Yeah, okay. And if you're young and able, then you work very hard. If the, you're working in the orchards, you're in the orchards at three in the morning picking oranges or picking grapefruit. And that is very hard work. Mm. But... There are many jobs and many roles that need to be played on a kibbutz. And really, it's an extraordinary society that is based on equality and based on giving your ability and getting according to your needs. So there's food prepared. You don't exchange money. There was a little shop that we had like bingo coupons that you would use to (laughs) spend and you'd try and, you know, get a few more or you'd swap with somebody to get more. (laughs) And the shop was had very limited items in it. What did it teach you? It taught me an enormous amount. The, the contrast between growing up in South Africa where people were discriminated against just because of the color of their skin and then coming to Israel where you were just treated equally. I, I could share a beautiful story that happened when we were on kibbutz in the very early days. A bunch of South Africans tourists came to work on the kibbutz for a couple of weeks and that very spoiled South Africans often white South Africans are fairly spoiled and the end of the first day one of the South Africans said to one of the kibbutz members where do I leave my shoes to be polished oh really now you can imagine that in South (laughs) Africa your shoes were polished because you had staff so the kibbutz member said oh don't worry just leave them outside your door And so for the first week, this young man left his boots outside the door every morning and he came in the morning and his boots were cleaned. And at the end of the week, there was a pile of boots the size of a mountain filled with the worst mud and grime and grit. (laughs) And the note on it said, this is kibbutz. It's your turn today. (laughs) Great lesson. (laughs) 
Growing up, what did food mean to you? Interestingly, my mother was a marvellous cook. Beautiful, wonderful food. I was the fussiest eater in the whole world. So I didn't actually appreciate her food almost until just before I was leaving. And certainly after I left our home because I was spoiled and she pandered to me. So chops and chips and hamburgers and chips and chocolate bars and chocolate milk was what I grew up on. Not fun when you arrived in Israel and there wasn't a chip or a burger or a lamb chop <laughs> or, or chocolate milk to be seen in Kui. <laughs> so I starved for the first month <laughs> um, because the produce in Israel is extraordinary. It's fresh produce, lots of dairy, and I'd never eaten cheese even, and that was a staple. What was it like living in Israel at that time? Look, it was quite exhilarating in terms of we'd been through the 67 war and Israel had come out, this was in 70 that I went, Israel had come out victorious. But in 73, there was another war and um, I'd never lived through a war and it was horrifying mm. and horrible. And in fact, I lost my brother-in-law in that war. Right. And... In fact, what happened in 67 is it changed Israel in a way that slowly, slowly crept into the acceptable. But in those early days, there were still lots of negotiations. In the 67 war, Israel conquered Jerusalem and parts of um, the, the desert and you know, lots of areas that they have not necessarily given back. Yeah. And so that became a challenge for me. I did it really? Yeah, it's part of the reason that I left Israel politically. Here you are living in a kibbutz, which is a commune, which I might argue is very close to socialism. It, you don't have to argue. I'm here to agree <laughs> with you on that one. <laughs> okay, so you start, you, you've moved into that, and then, but how do you then become an entrepreneur? Well, it's interesting because I didn't even know the word, but on the kibbutz, clearly I liked fashion already. I liked clothing. I liked nice things. And you have a very limited budget and a very limited little store with very little to buy on it. And that did not sit so well with me. And every now and again, we could go into the big smoke. And I went into Tel Aviv one time and I'd been sent a birthday gift from my parents. I had a little bit of money. And all these gorgeous Indian clothing were, had just reached, we're talking in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And I bought more than I needed and brought it back to the kibbutz and started selling it to my friends, which was not exactly egalitarian or right. kibbutz um, spirit. So I figure I'm, my entrepreneurial spirit started there, but everyone loved my clothes and bought them. <laughs> and then I had a little bit more money to buy more. So Didn't then, last long, that little foray, but it was fun. So when did business start kicking in? Business for me really started when I left the kibbutz. Um, my sister had just bought a florist. I needed something to do. And she said, all right, well, come and work with me. Now, I'd never been in business. I'd never touched a flower, nor did I know actually how to run a business. But it turns out that actually I was pretty good at it. I had the smarts, both from a creative point of view, I was okay with flowers. And from a business point of view, just the ability to negotiate well and to treat customers well and understand what it was going to take. And that went well. And that was my first little foray into business. When did you ultimately move to Australia? About 20 years. We, we lived on kibbutz for 10 years. We, we then moved into the city to try the city okay. because... Growing up in South Africa and being Jewish, you are inculcated with, the, with very much the spirit that Israel is the homeland of the Jews, yep. especially after the Second World War, especially after the Holocaust. Yep. We knew and know the importance of having a Jewish state. So leaving Israel was a tough decision, but an extraordinary one for my family. Moved to Australia in the late 80s. But what was the tipping point to do that, make that tough decision? Um, the tipping point was I have two sons 
and Israel has compulsory military conscription. And oh, okay. I, but if you leave the country before a child is 14, they do not automatically have to go to the army. If you leave even after they're 14, they can get called up from wherever they are in the world. And my oldest son had just turned 13, and I figured if we were going to do this, I needed to give him the best chance and let him decide if he ever would want to go to the army. And so that was really the decider for us. Why Australia? We had come to visit Australia because my brother-in-law had come to live here and it felt very familiar, very comfortable, very similar to South Africa, but without the overt problems. I didn't know that there might be any racial issues in Australia. And so it, I had a sister who lived in America, but I didn't want to bring up my kids in America. And Australia felt like a, a far enough away from the culture the Western culture that I didn't admire and that perhaps would be a simpler lifestyle for us and our family. So did you decide to pursue the entrepreneurial route straight away? No, not at all. When I arrived in Australia, the only thing I wasn't going to do was be a florist because <laughs> okay. I'd done that and it was bloody hard. <laughs> and I thought, I'm not doing that again. Except that we arrived in, in the end of January and my, I'll just say this now, my then husband, um, <laughs> and he started trying to find work and it looked like it was going to be really tough. Um, he, he only had a BA. It wasn't like he had major qualifications. And we arrived and in that first week in February, every newspaper, the only ads I could see were for florists. All right. Now, what's interesting is I lived in the Middle East and there were not the same festivals that you have in the Western world. Yep, yep. So I thought, okay, look, we were so desperate because we had come with very little money and we were worried that it was going to take him months to get a job. And so I thought I'll apply to get a florist job and at least it'll keep us going for a while. So I got a job with a florist on about the 10th of February. I'd never heard of Valentine's Day. What year is this? This is 1989. And you'd never heard of Valentine's Day? No, because <laughs> it didn't really exist. It, you know, it, it's, a, it's a consumer plot, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> a commercial consumer plot, which had not yet reached Israel. Anyway, I was fired on the 15th of February because <laughs> <laughs> Floris only hired extra hands because Valentine's Day in Australia is one of the busiest days of the year. Right. And so I had touched a flower and so I kind of started thinking about working with flowers again. And it didn't take long before I was back in floristry. Okay, so do you build a business from there or what happens? Um, I started doing some flowers from my home. Mm -hmm. But somebody asked me, somebody invited me to work in a shop for them, to run a shop for them. And it didn't take long before, so together, to go into partnership with them. And it didn't take long before we had three shops. Oh, really? Yeah. The truth is, all I knew was I needed money and I needed to survive and I needed food on our table. And I was willing to do anything. And the shops went well until I was doing more and more events. And I just wasn't seeing the kids and I thought, you know what? I could do flowers from home. So sold yeah, the wow. shops. Really? Yeah. Okay. And started working from my garage doing events. And 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 how it happened was somebody called me one day and said, I know that you had done flowers and I've got a party coming up. Yeah. Would you do the flowers? Yeah, and yeah. I said, sure. And then that person told other people and it just grew. The business grew. And it was amazing. And so I guess I do remember a weekend that I had nine events with no staff except the family and kids. You serious? Serious, <laughs> all running around. I mean, probably those people whose events I did might have known that I was like a blue-ass fly <laughs> running around. <laughs> but we did it. We did it. Um, yeah. And then then I was given an opportunity. Somebody called uh, 
I got a call one day to say that Sydney Casino is opening and would I be interested in doing pitching, tendering for that event. And I'd never done an event on that scale. That's grand scale. Grand scale. Totally grand scale. But undaunted, <laughs> I designed a, 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 an image of what I thought I could do, walked in and... What I'm clearly good at was selling a dream. Yeah, okay. And I sold the dream and got the gig. What did, you, what did you sell to them? I told them that the VIP room, which was yet to be designed and built, yeah. would be converted into a Middle Eastern, um, like an Arabian Nights. Okay. And, you know, I pictured it and described it and the starry nights and the beautiful props and flowers hanging and a marketplace and they bought it hook, line and sinker and then I had to build it. <laughs> so like the Hanging Gardens of Babylon in yeah, some part as well. Yeah, absolutely stunning is what I sold. Yeah. I, I did deliver. I did <laughs> deliver. And it was, the, I had to go and register because I had to sign up with the ATO because suddenly one, I was going to be earning, it was a huge gig. And secondly, it was for a casino and I had to be registered and made right. sure that I was bona fide. And so I quickly moved out of my garage and rented a warehouse. And that was the beginning of my event business, RKED, Ronnie Khan Event Designs. And I called it that because I had seen DKNY, Donna Karan, New York, and thought yeah. that looked pretty cool. <laughs> so I could do RKED. <laughs> I'm yeah. a quick learner. You're pretty good under pressure too, aren't you? Yeah, it seems so. Yeah. What's the art of business then? To me, the art of business is providing customers with an extraordinary experience of something they need, not necessarily something they don't think they need. And that's painting the vision, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And being able to deliver on that promise. So how does all this manifest itself to this thing called Oz Harvest? Well, I built my business and at that point in time, what I was really chasing was money. Success had a very different meaning for me then. And I really, really thought that what I wanted was bigger and more and more things. A relationship ended and by then I had left my husband. I got into a relationship where I suddenly realized how my values were so unaligned to who I really was yeah, okay. that it was actually quite a shock. And it, it concurred at the same time with my business life really having a problem that needed to be solved. And the problem that I had in my business life, I was creating all these beautiful, wonderful events. From that first event, yep. I started getting into doing wonderful corporate events and bigger events. And every single one of my events had food. Food is about sharing. Food is about caring. It's about dignity. It's about abundance. It's about success and generosity. And I wanted every one of my clients to look extremely successful. And in order to do that, I wanted people to leave an event knowing that their host was so successful and never wanted my guests to have to go to Macca's on the way home. Yeah, right. And so my tables groaned and people would leave and there was all this food and I was throwing it away because it was late at night. You start putting a gig together, it's early in the morning and you finish and it's three in the morning yeah, the well, next morning. Yeah. But I did one event that was just so huge and there was so much food that it was just unconscionable to throw it away. And so I loaded it up into my little sports car because that was one of the symbols of my success. Oh, yeah. And took that food to the only place I knew, and that was to the Matthew Talbot Hostel. And it was pretty confronting. There were people and bodies, and guys hanging around, and I rocked up and knocked on the door and said, would you have this food? And they took it with such gracious gratitude that I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. And so I started becoming a rogue food rescuer in that I could, I would take the food that I had and drop it off somewhere. I didn't know very many places, but Matthew Talbot said, well, you know, there's another place around the corner. And they told me there's another place. And so the idea was forming, but certainly wasn't, was not born. Um, 
I thought I could do it, but you know, I needed my business, my I needed to earn money. Yeah. And so I just started doing it on the side until I chose to visit South Africa again. What happened there? I met up with this wonderful woman, our neighbors, Selma Brody, beautiful human being who I hadn't seen for years because I hadn't been back, but had always stayed in connection with Alan, her son, and I had got married when we were three and four. He stole his mother's engagement ring. And when my mother found it, she said, what is this? And I was three. I just said, it's mine. And she thought it didn't look like it came from a lucky packet. <laughs> so she ran over to the neighbors to Selma and said, do you know anything about this ring? And Selma said, yeah, it's my engagement ring. Anyway, so Selma was this very special, very um, liberal and very active, an activist in South Africa. That's, she'd stayed and lived in South Africa. And so I went to visit her for a week, just thinking, oh, I'll just have a little break while I'm thinking about where I'm at, a little confusion, end of one relationship. And anyway, Selma took me to Soweto and I'd never been to Soweto before. Um, because when I lived in South Africa, a white person didn't venture into Soweto. So it was scary. It was confronting to go with her. What do you reckon made her take you there? Well, I didn't know at the time because in the meanwhile, South Africa was a different country and had changed. But she did say she had stuff to do there that she was going to check on a clinic that she'd set up. And just hearing about her AIDS clinic that she'd set up was right. inspirational. Yeah. But as we drove into Soweto, when she told me that very humbly and under her, under her breath kind of said she had been responsible for electricity in Soweto. Now, at the time, there were three, four million people living in Soweto, and the hairs on my arms just stood up, and all I could think of is, what does it feel like to know that you've made a difference to that many people? And actually, by the time we got to the AIDS clinic, I'd already decided I was going to build a food rescue organization, because that's what I knew. I knew that there was food and I knew there were people in need. I didn't know much more about how I was going to do that, but I did. I was smitten with the notion that I could do something significant. Is it like an epiphany then, is it? Absolutely. And, you know, it's a light bulb moment. And often I feel that sometimes I'm talking to people and, and I can see when it clicks for them and it's just the most extraordinary thing. But not everybody acts on it. No, many people don't. And we find a million reasons not to. Yeah. But I was a woman possessed. That vision of doing something was what drove me. And knowing that the only thing I knew was food and people, what if I did that? Okay, so it sounds great. You've had the epiphany. You've seen some, some bad some bad things, mm -hmm. you take all that on board and you fly back home. Yeah. And you're still feeling great about this epiphany. And I'm telling everybody <laughs> that I'm going to start a food rescue organization. And yet I still have to put food on the plate. So yeah. how do you balance this and how do you get there? Yeah. So for the first seven years of Oz Harvest, I worked full time in my business. Because Did I didn't start Oz Harvest to earn a living. I started Oz Harvest because it was my passion project and I needed to earn a living at the same time. And it didn't occur to me. And in fact, when the board came to me, well, I was offered an award which allowed me to seek over into working full time. But the condition was I had to give up my business. And the salary was really an eighth of what I was earning at the time. Mm -hmm. But by that stage, I'd reached that point that it was like jumping off a parachute, do it or else you'll never do it. So I closed the doors of my business. I didn't even really? try and sell it. And worked for Oz Harvest for a year. And the difference in that year, that my full-time effort and, and all my time went into Oz Harvest was extraordinary. I was nominated as, I, I won Australian of the Year Local Hero. Um, all of, you know, Everything around our profile just shifted and changed. Um, and the board then said, would I stay on as full-time CEO? 
And so I've worked for Oz Harvest ever since. And it was a challenge for me to even, I had to have a conversation with my spiritual teacher to say, is it okay to take money to work for the thing that you love? Mm. So what actually is it, Ronnie? You said food rescue. Yeah. Is, that, is that how you defined Oz Harvest? How do, how do you define what you've created? Well, I define it very differently today to what it was. There's no doubt that it was food rescue is what we did and is where the innovation was okay. and what triggered people's imaginations. Because many, many people had said, oh, I thought of doing this. I saw there was leftover food. I thought we could have done something with it. A million people have told me that, but they didn't do it. And I'm not sure why I was the one who's been gifted to do that, but that is how I feel. I feel it somehow it was my destiny to do that. Um, but today we're much, we're a much broader organization, though most people don't know that because whilst we rescue food, the biggest challenge is that our food system is broken. Mm -hmm. okay. And so we also have to understand that we've lost the value of food. And we also have to understand that education around sustainability and valuing food and knowing how to use it are all hugely important. So actually, our pillars are rescue, educate, engage, which is engage us with community because we have over three and a half thousand volunteers, innovation, which is how we keep coming up with new ideas, but sustainability is an, is a very strong pillar for us. I mean, most people wouldn't know, but in 2015, prior to the UN SDG goals, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals being announced, yeah. we, as Harvest, me, got our country to commit to halving food waste. Initially, we thought by 2025, when the UN SDG goal was announced two years later to 2030, our country committed to halving again because they had done nothing in the two years that they had committed when I got them to commit in 2015 um, to committing again. And quite honestly, Greg, it's it's 2021. We have nine years to achieve that. So from an Oz Harvest point of view, we have are ramping up and amplifying all our efforts around education and shifting and changing how we behave around food and how we treat food so that we can achieve those goals because it's incredibly important. It's costing the economy, you know, 1.3 trillion in Australia. It's costing us, the conservative estimate is $20 billion a year. Now imagine if we could redistribute half of that to other causes, to other programs, it would be very powerful. But how are we going, Ronnie? Are we uh, hitting it? Are we getting anywhere near no. the initial targets or not? No, well, where we are is there is definitely a shift. And actually, COVID helped us a lot okay. in a way. Right. On the one hand, it created panic buying and huge stress around food. And it affected us harvest enormously because there were huge fluctuations around food. And we collect surplus food and have never bought food. But for the first time, because there was such a challenge around food and the need went up by 78% to 100%, at some periods and is now settled on 50% more than it was pre-COVID. So every charity is saying they could take 50% more food from us. So during that time though, we were stuck at home and people, restaurants closed. We won't even talk about the hospitality industry and what it did to that, but what it meant was we were having to think about food, prepare food. So there has definitely been a greater awareness around food and the value of food. And it's the one of the things we just hoping doesn't get forgotten as we in this lucky country like seek out of COVID. Where is it really broken? You said the food system is broken. So what? So for the people out there listening, Ronnie. What does that look like? Yeah. What it looks like is that a third of all food that's produced goes to waste. One third. One third. So we waste a third in our households really? and the producers waste a third because we are picky and because of distribution channels and because of the food supply chain. So I've been on farms in Northern Queensland where the farmer has 
and I'm not sure if you know what it takes to grow a banana, but to see a banana growing, there are layers of tissue paper. Each hand is wrapped. I mean, it's an enormous amount of labor, not even talking about the water, the fuel, the energy, and the physical uh, aspects of what it takes. Yep. And when he picks those bananas, less than a third don't even make it to the distribution center because it's too expensive because he knows they're going to be rejected because they've got a freckle or oh, a black mark. Yeah, right. And what we want is perfection. So we have to shift. We've become a consumptive society. And so we need to shift and change our behavior. When we go shopping, we think we can just buy. Research shows us that one out of five shopping bags we waste. So that third of those bananas, which have the freckle or whatever yeah. it is. Don't even make it. So where do they go? Back and back into the ground well, and that's it? back into the ground. Now there are many more new innovations. So some farmers might take those bananas and are now trying to turn them into banana flour. Yeah, right. Okay. And, you know, our partner Woolworths is making banana bread from the very soft, squishy bananas that Oz Harvest benefits from. But, um, yeah, it's just we have to be, we just have to be smarter and we have to be more aware. And every single one of us, it's the low-hanging fruit, excuse the pun, but every single one of us has a responsibility and an ability to make a difference. You know, when you come back and you have that epiphany and yeah. you're, you're all well, good intention, okay? You're, and thank God you've got the business background to put it together, all right? Are people well-meaning to come in to support you? Like, how does it get off the ground? You know, in a way, I was a little bit like a magnet, and I still say I'm a magnet for magnificent people because I would say, you know, I'm going to go and rescue food. And people would just say, well, what do you need? What can we help you with? And I was just led from one person to the next who said, just led me to, honestly, I know people say that it's hard to say no to me. I think it's hard to say no to a brilliant idea and to something that makes such a huge difference. But I have found continual for the last 17 years, extraordinary support. Yeah. From individuals, from businesses, from foundations, from trusts. Yeah. Someone asked you once, what is your agenda? Yeah. Mm. When, you, when you were traveling in LA, is that right? Yeah, well, when I went, I heard about an organization that was rescuing food just as I was starting Oz Harvest. And so I went, I flew there to check it out because I figured why reinvent the wheel if somebody's doing it? And the founder of that organization did as we were leaving, said, Ronnie, just what is your agenda? Don't ever forget to ask yourself that question. And I didn't really understand it at the time, but I certainly have thought about it and understand it now. And I don't think my agenda's changed actually ever. And it really was to be of service, to make a difference, to be able to impact as many people as possible. Yeah, but when, when are you going to feel success, Ronnie? When I put us Harvest out of business, <laughs> I didn't set it up as a Band-Aid. You know, I wanted, I, I literally thought I would, we would just rescue food until there was no more food to rescue. But at that time, I didn't know that a third of all food goes to waste. I didn't yeah. know that it was a global issue. So I think I will feel that we've had success when we have food waste, when we put systems in place that make us value food better, when people understand what labeling laws mean, when they don't chuck out a yogurt on the day of the 12th of February because it says it should be dead and over by then. Yep. When they understand that they can taste it, smell it, and if it's fine, nothing's going to happen to yeah. them. But Ronnie, what's the, uh, the situation in Australia in regards to red tape? Because food is a very sensitive issue, correct? Absolutely. And yeah. if you're driving around in your van picking up food from people goodwilling and giving it to people in need, that, that can be fraught with danger according to law, can't it? Yeah, well, what was one of the challenges I faced really early on because some of my caterers were amazing and they gave us food and a few little stores, mom and pop stores gave us food. But when I realized how much there was and looked at like the big players, it became very apparent. They said, we wouldn't touch you with a barge foot pole. 
we worried about our liability. Yeah, right. And so I didn't like that. And so I, I got some pro bono lawyers to help and we lobbied and they lobbied and we had the laws changed um, in 2005 in New South Wales, in 2008 in the ACT, 2009 in Queensland and South Australia, which allowed good food to be given away for free without fear of liability. So it removed all the barriers because that would have been a major barrier and was a barrier until the law, we managed to get that passed. Ice Harvest also makes food? Well, we during COVID, our lives changed significantly. There were fluctuations of food. As I said, we had to lobby government to get funding because yeah. we never used government. We had very little, 3% of our funding was government funding. But suddenly we found ourselves as an essential service with not the product to be able to give away. Okay. And so we needed to purchase food. And also our charities, many closed down, but suddenly they couldn't, people were sitting in homes, elderly people, vulnerable people, yep. and there was a huge need for cooked food. So we rolled out a program. We rolled out two programs. Okay. One has turned into a beautiful innovation and a new little business for us as an income stream. Mm -hmm. The other was a solution and an impact driven solution. We started cooking and we used some of the chefs that had lost their businesses. We paid them to give us food. We created 37, we call them HOSPO heroes <laughs> partnerships, our hospitality chefs and businesses who we got to cook food for us, as well as our own kitchens. And we produced between the 1st of March and this week, and we are still cooking, over 750,000 meals that we've given away over the last year. And that's a new program that didn't exist pre-COVID. Wow. But our innovative money-making little business that we also rolled out towards late last year was we realized people are sitting at home, restaurants aren't open, and we launched this gorgeous business called Harvest Bites, mm -hmm. where we got some of our wonderful chefs to cook food, to cook for us, prepare a gourmet style restaurant meal, which people can order. At the moment, the business is only in Sydney okay. and Greater Sydney, so 20K radius from... Alexandria. So it's eastern suburbs. Um, it's going to the northern beaches as well, but all the way around. Yeah. And so on a Monday, you can order Harvest Bites that were prepared by Peter Gilmore or Michael Rantisi or Neil Perry and get it delivered in your home. And all you have to do is heat it. And every time you order a meal for two, it allows us Harvest to deliver 40 more meals to people in need. So that's our cutest little program that if people don't know about is so delicious and worth trying on a Monday. How's it going? It's going great. We've just extended it and we now are ramping it up and building a marketplace that will also work with a much bigger range of restaurants as well as products. You can order wonderful products like homemade pickles and gorgeous things that are stopping good food from going to waste and helping us deliver more food. You've got to see firsthand the devastation of COVID-19 to the poor restaurants. Yeah. How bad is it? It's bad. It's really bad. And I'm so worried that when Job Seeker and Job Keeper end, that some of those restaurants will never reopen, never be able to sustain themselves because of the hit that they've taken. Many restaurants won't open again. Um, some of them have redesigned themselves. It's been an extraordinary time for the hospitality industry. And I think any of the schemes where federal state governments offered, you know, to s let people go out into restaurants and purchase were brilliant and should be, should absolutely be rolled out because we do need to support the industry. One, because of casual workers, and one of the beautiful, I'll just share with you, um, 
one of the programs we rolled out during COVID was called um, Hamper Hubs. We created Hamper Hubs because casual workers, particularly from the hospitality industry and international students, had no support from our government yeah, right. whatsoever. And so we created places that they could go to. We call them Hamper Hubs and collect beautifully curated boxes that had fresh produce and core products that they could make meals through the week. On Sunday morning, I walked into a restaurant in the eastern suburbs just for coffee. And the young waiter came up to me with a very strong accent and he pointed to me and he said, you're Ronnie, aren't you? You're the founder of Oz Harvest. And I said, yes, what's your name? And he said, it's Bruno. I said, Bruno, you know, how do you know? He said, I want to thank you. You fed me for the last year. I'm an international student. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And this is real, real people. When you come across someone like that who's now got a job and you can know that he's studying and his family put all their money towards him coming here to study and his studies ended and he had no work and he had to come and get food. He said he'd never in his life believed he'd have to pick up a hamper of food and wouldn't be able to feed himself. She's running, here's a different question. How tough is it out there? And we're, we're all sitting here, we're, we're all gainfully employed. What is it really like out there? It's tough. There are a million people who've lost their jobs who never, some of them never thought they'd be in that position. Never thought they'd need any kind of support because they were gainfully employed or able to be employed. So there's a new cohort of people who yeah, need really. food. We have a free supermarket and we're seeing 300 to 400 people a day and some of them are not the typical people that we would normally have seen. Our supermarket is open to anybody. Anybody can come to it. It's a take what you need and give if you can. And it's definitely seeing a different demographic. What are you seeing in regards to mental care? There's not even any doubt that the challenges that individuals are facing as a result of COVID is enormous and there's huge damage repair and work needing to be done in that area for sure. You mentioned the government. Did they come to the rescue? Did they support you? They absolutely did. The question is, will they continue to? Because COVID might end, but food relief and the needs around those that have lost their work will not end on the 1st of March. Or, you know, we're now in a very stop-start kind of economy because if COVID comes back, we stop everything so that it doesn't spread. Now, we've been incredibly lucky and incredibly fortunate. But I'm absolutely hoping and confident that our government will see the impact of what we've delivered. Over 33 million meals were delivered this year. 33 million? 33 million meals were delivered through all our programs this year, which means that the need is there and that we will now need more support than we've ever needed before. Do you get a lot of corporate support? We get incredible corporate support. We get foundations, but the trouble with corporate support is many of our Corporates are in the industry that has been the worst hit. If you think about the hospitality industry, oh. the hotel industry, yeah. they're all still struggling. They're still there and hanging in. But um, yeah, we're working really closely with them to see how we can all support each other. Ronnie, what drives you? You know, I'm filled with such gratitude every single day and I'm completely driven when I think about the children, the parents, those people who have fallen through the cracks through no fault of their own. I'm, I'm inspired every day to do more, completely committed to doing more. And as a leader, how do you choose people to come and work with you in your team? Every single person that gets interviewed to come to Oz Harvest, I do the last interview. I do. Whether they're the driver or whether they are part of our education team, it doesn't matter who. I interview, do the last interview, because you can always train for skills, but you cannot train for attitude. 
So attitude is what I'm looking for. And I'm looking for people who are purpose driven. Uh, I, can I share a little story? We mm -hmm. had this gorgeous guy who came in to support. We were desperate when we were building the hampers. We needed actually a procurement manager and we hired someone who turned out to be absolutely brilliant. He had lost his job through COVID and our pay is not really commensurate with corporate pay. Mm -hmm. People who come and work for us know that they are gaining on purpose, meaning and life filling joy, but that doesn't always pay the bills. Our salaries are definitely lower. And at the end of working with us for six months, this gorgeous guy who, as far as we were concerned, would have a job with us forever, turned around and said, look, I, I actually need to go out and earn more. And I was approached, he has great logistics and he's a wonderful procurement manager. And he got a job and said, I'm just so sorry, I feel you know, it's the saddest day for me, but I'm leaving and I'm going to take a new job. At the end of the week, he called and said, I can't do it. I cannot do it. I'd rather earn less. I want to be part of the family. I belong in Oz Harvest. I'm coming back if you'll have me. I just, I've made the choices. And so, you know, there's something magical about working for purpose and meaning. You take leadership seriously? Oh, yeah. I take it incredibly seriously. It's a huge responsibility. I never thought of myself ever as a leader, but when my people call me, hey boss, I realize that I must be leading something. <laughs> and then they tell me that there are 235 people employed in my business. So I guess I am a leader, but it's a huge responsibility. And I am incredibly both proud and humbled to be called a leader. So how do you lead and how do you communicate your message effectively? Well, I believe in sharing my message from my heart. I've never written a message, written a speech. Um, it's all head and heart connected. And I would hope that I lead with authenticity, that honesty. I would never ask a single person to do what I wouldn't do myself in any part of our business. And I would hope that I set an example that my people will follow. You mentioned authenticity a couple of times today. Do you think we see enough of it out there? I know that we don't. I know that we don't. I see it in every one of these major businesses that glibly say this or talk about values and then do something. Look, you can even talk about our government. But Very true. <laughs> it's unfortunate that the honest, real people don't bring their whole selves to work. They're too scared to bring their whole selves to work. And that's something that I would hope that I've encouraged every single one of my staff to do. What do you mean by that? What's whole self to work? It means that I don't want you to leave anything behind. If you come to work and you're a mother and you need to go and look after your children, then you tell your manager that I'm sorry I'm leaving at three because my kid's got a school meeting that I have to be at. I don't want people to come to work thinking that they can't share their deepest loves, joys, fears, because we spend more time at work than we do at home. So how could you separate yourself out? And that's really what we're seeing in the corporate world today, that people are petrified. They come to work and work is not a work talks about being value led and value driven but it's superficial and not real. And many businesses obviously are trying to turn that around. And in fact, I'm going to be rolling out a coaching, beautiful coaching program about bringing your whole self to work for, for business. Well, I was going to ask you, you know, it's not easy being at the top, as you know. Yeah. Um, when do you take the time to think? So I spend a lot of time, I do meditate and it's not you won't often see me sitting with my legs crossed and going, um, but there are times that I do do that, but I go for walks early in the morning. I train, I, you know, I'll be on that bloody treadmill, but it's okay because I'm thinking about all the wonderful things I could be doing at work and things that I could roll out and things that my people could do. So I'm a very active thinker. Also, when I swim, I love to think about what 
else we could be doing. Innovation. You've talked about it a little bit. Can you give us some examples where you from where you started and where you're going? Yeah, look, innovation is in our DNA. I mean, just by making sure that good food would never get thrown away means that we did something different that nobody had ever done. And we've continued. We keep rolling out great new programs. Technology is hugely important to us. We've rolled out an app that has been a little disappointing in that it's not actually fulfilled what we hoped it would, but we're redesigning it. Okay. And so we're just really always, we always want to be on the edge. We, we're considered leaders, thought leaders in food waste, thought leaders in how we can do things differently. And that is really who we are. And this has gone offshore now, Ronnie? Yeah, our model has been shared in the UK, in New Zealand, in South Africa. At the moment in Japan, there's a wonderful young man who came and spent time with us and we share our model with him. Um, people in Peru, oh, yeah, all over the world, there are people who have looked and who we have worked with and continue to work with to share our model. And do you get many business people come to spend time with you? We get studied in... Lots of universities, MBA courses, all the time we get told that Oz Harvest is a case study right. and people come and um, want to work with us during the MBAs and groups so from that point of view all the time. But we do get, you know, businesses, we work very closely with businesses because we've got great staff engagement programs, which is the way we can give back. You know, it's very obvious what we need. We need money yeah. to grow yep. and we need food. Yep. And so what we give back is value-driven programs to employees, okay. to staff. So there's lots of engagement with business. So is the education programs appropriate? Our education programs that we're rolling out are fantastic in that they're, they're threefold. Okay. One is for vulnerable people, and that's to teach vulnerable people and people who have financial challenges how to live um, how to live a sustainable life, how to cook and how to purchase and produce meals on a very low budget. We've created beautiful, we've got a wonderful program that communities can tap into, charitable organizations can tap into, and individuals can tap into. That's called NEST. We have a program called Nourish that vulnerable youth, 15 and 25, can come to and it teaches hospitality skills. People come to us for six months, learn life skills. They walk into us, you know, a 15 year old in a hoodie with no ability to even look you in the eye. Oh, okay. And six months later, they stand up at their graduation with skills that are accredited, they can get a job and they say, you've opened a door that we didn't even know existed. And then we've got our FEAST program, which goes into schools, into primary schools, and we're just rolling it out into high school. And that is, again, teaching sustainability, how to cook, how to look after food, how to grow food, how to compost, and how to look after our planet. And the, our major new direction, since both the film, that documentary that was made, and rolling out, is our fight food waste. And that is to all of us, how we educate and shift each and every one of us to take responsibility. And behave, we're working with behavioral scientists, we're working with universities, because shifting and changing behavior is the most difficult thing to do. We don't like changing our behavior. And so we've got to find all the ways to make it easy for us to do that. Are there any communities in Australia, Ronnie, that you're concerned about in terms of food insecurity or food availability? Absolutely. Indigenous remote areas, it's horrendous. We live in an enormous country, enormous. And there are areas where there are pockets of people who do not have access to the quality, freshness, and variety of healthy food that many of us in the cities and in urban areas have access to. And that is a big challenge. And that's one of the things we looked at with our technology, how we can connect remote communities with healthy food. And it's a challenge because of the size of our country, but it's one that we have to address. If I had a magic telephone sitting right here, Ronnie, and at the end of that phone was the Prime Minister. Yeah. 
what would be the message or what advice or what ideas would you pass on? Well, the beautiful thing is the ideas have all been worked on. We've got them. All I would say is if you gave me $150 million today, we could fundamentally shift and change the face of food relief in Australia. So how easy is that? ScoMo, are you listening? <laughs> so is that what you need, 150? Well, listen, I'd always take more. <laughs> you know, I'll start with 150. But you really think you can move the dial that much, could you? I do think we could move the dial because we would get business on board and we could reach areas that we were, are not able to reach now. Absolutely. I mean, when, yep, give me 150 and I'll make it work. Are they listening? Um, not as much as we would hope, but we're about to go whisper in their ear big time. In fact, not whisper, roar. <laughs> so we're going to hear it all the way down to our, in every street of Sydney, are we? I hope so. Spiritual. Spiritual is the driver. What does that mean? What it means is if you don't live with gratitude and you don't live with humility every single day at the awe of this world, then you're not alive. You're thinking like that all the time, do you? I certainly do in every part of my life from the minute I wake up in the morning with gratitude to when I go to bed at night. All we have is now, this very minute. We just went through COVID. We all thought we were in control of our lives. And one day, boom, the world shut down. And unless we take note and unless we are kinder and gentler and all do tiny little random acts of kindness every single day that can ripple out, we will live in a very miserable place. You reference Nelson Mandela. Yeah, my hero. Ever met him? No, but my, my closest was that Selma, my, my mentor, Selma knew him well. Jules was at university with him. Why is he such a hero to you? Because he could have landed up hating and he forgave. And he could have landed up being a bitter, miserable human being. And he turned into the most action oriented inspirational human being because he forgave and was filled with gratitude. Bonnie, what kind of message do you want to make sure or were you expressing in your book? So I want every person who reads that book to know that they have the ability. One, they have a story. And two, they have the ability to make a difference. I am just, I've, I've been gifted the, the ability to do what I do, but every single one of us, instead of looking for purpose to the left or to the right or hoping you'll find it on a supermarket shelf, should look in the mirror and look deep inside and find what it is that brings them joy and happiness because the more you spend time doing that, the more you are likely to add value to someone else's life. And I want people to know that whatever it is they do, it cannot be at the expense of either our planet or the people around them. I so firmly believe that when you live in gratitude, you cannot but relate to people kindly and you cannot relate to our planet. You cannot take things for granted. And unfortunately, many of us think that the trimmings of success and power are long lasting, but they're not. You know, you just have to ask the most powerful leaders in the world who are no longer the most powerful leaders in the world. It doesn't last. Mm -hmm. So it's only fleeting, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. And yet goodness and, and the fact that you could make a difference to one human being would always stay. Now, I also read you, um, didn't you touch base with the Duchess of Cornwall at one stage? I did. She came to visit. Oh, now, what was that like? <laughs> Actually extraordinary. You know, there was so much hype around the visit and fear and you're not allowed to touch her and you're not allowed to do this and you have to bow and you have to, you know, she was just so lovely and so human and so real. And as a result of her, we opened UK Harvest because she said, I'd like to see this in 
the UK. And nobody says that to me without me following up on that. <laughs> so that's why we went there. But also, one of the things we did when she came in, she participated in one of our cooking classes for our youth for this, through our Nourish program. And they made the most delicious bread and butter pudding and she got to taste it afterwards. And she turned around and said, my husband loves bread and butter pudding. Now, I mean, when you think who her husband is, <laughs> now he was at government house. So as they'd left, I thought, oh my God, I missed the biggest opportunity. So we bundled up a tray of <laughs> bread and butter pudding. Did you really? Absolutely. <laughs> And sent it off with one of our trucks to government house and delivered it for Prince Charles. <laughs> we sure did. Yeah, they're just real people. I also had the privilege of going to her 70th birthday party at uh, Clarence House. And so I met Charles as well. And yeah, they're pretty special. Just ordinary people who have had to live a very extraordinary in the limelight fairly miserable life. Now you talked a few minutes ago and I really appreciate you giving us that insight of what we were going to expect. You're going to roar and your team's <laughs> going to roar pretty soon. Yeah. But you're filled with this passion. Yeah. Okay. And you've got these goals. Do you get rattled by much? As a leader, do you get rattled by much or is it, I just take it in my stride or what is it all about? This isn't easy to build, this is it? You know, there's, there's a lot of, this is hard work what you're doing doesn't ever feel like hard work. Not a day that I've worked in the last 17 years feels like work. Every single day, I'm so passionate to jump up in the morning, to meet my team, to do what needs to be done. So do I get rattled? Not very much because I have an absolute and utter belief that what we are doing is the right thing and we're doing it in the right way. And I just have to navigate through whatever that challenge is on that particular day. And breathing deeply, taking deep breaths. You know, when you panic, you go, <laughs> and that doesn't allow your mind to think. And you really tend to, I, I don't know because I don't do that. But what I do do is I take very deep breaths. And that gives me the time and the ability to strategize, to rethink, to follow my instincts. I'm very much an instinctive leader. Ronnie, every day of the week, I'm dealing with chairman in the ASX and they're always seeking that special individual to join their board. What would Ronnie Khan have to say about contemplating a career on the board? I believe I've got huge value to give because so many of the corporations that I look at, the missing piece for them, I believe, is that authentic value-driven piece. And so not only have I built and run, and now it's a multi-million dollar organization. I believe that I have lessons that I've learned that could be very valuable. And I would be, I'd be very interested and keen to think about perhaps joining or becoming a board member of some boards. Do you think people really understand, and this is very important, right? The complexity that goes with the purpose-driven organizations that, that you're in. I think they probably underestimate it. I mean, I've never run Oz Harvest in any other way than a business from the day that I started it. And the fact that it's a charity is just quite incidental. Every part about us, our governance, our every part of the business using other people's money means we've had to be even more stringent, more cautious, more careful around building this business than, than you would if you were just recklessly building your own business. So I think that I personally and our industry has enormous skills because to run our business successfully, you've got to run it lean and mean, but you've got to have the most extraordinary impact. And, you know, we judged so much more harshly and the rewards are, are so different to the rewards that, you know, a, a CEO might get that golden handshake. Well, that will help them to live well for a while. But, you know, you have to live with yourself. And I believe that's the difference. And that's the value that I could bring. Without giving me everything about this big plan, <laughs> I know it's coming soon. What are we talking 
roughly about? Well, we're talking about shifting the behaviour of Australians. So that is pretty huge. We are literally talking about halving food waste. Now, given that we waste so much, it's a big ask, but we've got to do it. We just have to do it. And I want Australia to be the first country to achieve that. What's the roadblocks? People, um, money. It does take money because if you think about it, if you can sell crap, terrible products that are unhealthy for us and people buy them, there's only one reason and that's because millions of dollars have been put into a campaign to make us believe that they are good for you or that they're not going to harm you. So I need the money to run the campaigns around good messages as opposed to the bad messages. It's just done anywhere else in the world, Ronnie? Not yet, not yet. And I'm hoping that we certainly will be releasing an Australian first, a world first, okay. with some of our research that's going to come out in September, October. But, you know, this is collaborative. There's so much going on and there are lots of passionate and extraordinary people out there doing extraordinary things. And we need to tap into that. We need to find that out. We need to understand what people are doing so that we're not working at the same time on similar problems in different ways if we could all pool our knowledge. So there's a lot of work to be done, but it's doable. Ronnie, if you were to look back at that young girl growing up in South Africa many years ago now, what advice would you give her? probably would say you will never believe what you're going to be. <laughs> so go with the flow, girl, and trust and just do your thing. Because <laughs> there's not a lot I would have changed, you know. I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't gone on the journey that I've gone on to get to where I am today. So I don't regret a single thing. Probably could have done things a little easier and a little quicker, a little faster, maybe. (laughs) On that, Ronnie, really appreciate you making the time to join us today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the conversation we've had today. You've been listening to No Limitations.